Let me invite your attention this morning to the fourth chapter of the book of Matthew. While you're turning there, I want to mention, I know you've heard it a couple of times already this morning, I want to mention that next Sunday is the uh, 42nd annual March for Life, um, 47 years ago. On January 22nd of 1973 was a Supreme Court decision, Roe v. Wade, that authorized the killing of unborn children at any stage while they were growing in the safety of the womb. And if you've been around Gary Springs very long, you know we took a very strong stands, uh, stand on life. And one of the reasons we show up next Sunday to march, you know, you could look at it and say, well, it's been uh, 47 years and, and nothing has changed. Well, we know personally as a church body that while maybe nothing has changed in regard to the law of the land, we have seen, in fact, a few weeks ago, you met a child that was saved because of our faithfulness to pray and to stand for life. And we know that happens over and over and over again. So I want to encourage you next Sunday to consider uh, joining me, uh, lots of Geyer Springs folks, and then thousands of people from around the state. All the details are there. Uh, in your bulletin. Let me also mention that w when we say we're a pro-life church, one of the arguments sometimes that's thrown uh, at, at pro-life folks and organizations is, well, all you care about is the baby. No, we care about anyone uh, whose life is threatened or in danger. We, we're about the whole process. In fact, I don't know if you noticed when you came in this morning, but I hope as you leave uh, both here and upstairs in the venue that you'll stop by the main lobby. The main lobby is filled with partner organizations that we work with, and it's not just crisis pregnancy centers. It's our children's home. It's uh, Second Chance Ranch. It's uh, human trafficking. It's, it's uh, organizations that help with foster and adoption. It's even one organization that helps women who've had an abortion that are dealing with uh, the post-traumatic uh, stress from that, an organization to help them. So we believe in helping in any way we can on any front in the issue of life. Uh, next week, next Sunday, if, if you've never gotten involved before, it's just a simple way. It takes about 45 minutes uh, at the state capitol, just a simple way to stand and say that we uh, defend life. Um, second thing this morning, we're, we're journeying through the New Testament together. We're encouraging all of the body um, to read through the New Testament this year. It's just five chapters a week, uh, just a chapter a day is going to get us through the entire New Testament. Now, if you're like me, um, this last week we were Matthew 1 through 5. I got to go back through Matthew 5. There's a lot, lot there. But there are journals available. Most of you, I think about a thousand, ordered these in advance. But if you did not do that, you weren't here, you're just hearing this for the first time, we do still have journals available uh, today in the main lobby. Um, you can stop by and get those. It's got a place to write your daily uh, notes from your study. It's got a place for, oh, sermon notes. Huh, what a novel idea. You never know when the pastor might say something worth jotting down, or you might see some scriptural insight. It's a place for that. Scripture memory, I know you already went through the scripture memory verse uh, for this month. We're going to memorize 12 verses together this year, and then, of course, a place to, uh, to jot down um, your, your prayer requests and the things that you see uh, God answer. But it's not too late for you to jump in and, and join us in that. All right, the message this morning, uh, we, we will be preaching from... Uh, what you have read through the week. The message this morning is in Matthew chapter 4 and verses 1 through 11. Let's look at that together. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, and he said to him, All these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Well, we're at the beginning, or, or the launch point, if you will, from, from Matthew's 
um, description or journal of Jesus' ministry. If you look back in, in Matthew chapter 3, he describes the baptism and the anointing of Jesus. Jesus was baptized when he came up out of the water. Uh, the Holy Spirit uh, anointed him, landed on him. God said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. So that was the, the declaration of who Jesus is, that he's the Son of God. And the temptation here in Matthew 4 is the demonstration of who he is. He is the perfect, uh, sinless Son of God. Uh, he has power over Satan. He has power over evil. And he was perfect and sinless. And as we look at the temptation of Jesus, we, we've got to ask, uh, what is it that God, what, what help, what understanding does God have here for us? He didn't put that in there just to record it. Obviously, in, in putting that in and having Matthew record that, there's some things that we can learn from the temptation of Jesus. Now, let me mention this at the outset. It's important that we understand that God can't be tempted to do evil, nor does he tempt us to do evil. You see that in James chapter 1 and verse 13. James explains that when you're tempted, uh, you can't blame God. You can't say that's from God. You can't say God's trying to, to trip me up because God has no evil in him. He couldn't possibly tempt us to do evil, and he doesn't do evil. In James 1, 1 through 12, he does mention that God does allow trials to come into our life for our benefit. Why? Because trials prove our faith. If our faith is never tested, it will never be strengthened. If our faith is, if faith is never tested, we will never know if it's a true and genuine faith. So God will allow trials to come to test our faith and to make us stronger and to build our character. So trials are allowed by God or brought on by God, but temptation is not from God. The purpose of temptation is to make us fail, to, to entice us or to, to lead us into sin. God can't tempt us to sin and God cannot do evil. So, we have a problem right out of the gate here in verse 1. Look at it again. It says that Jesus was led up by the Spirit. What Spirit? The Spirit of God. Jesus was led by the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. There's kind of a holy tension here, and, and I don't really know how to help you with it, but just to say that while God doesn't tempt, clearly he's saying here, the Spirit led Jesus to the place where he would be tempted. Why would God do that? You know, sometimes those trials or the testing or the proving of our faith is going to include temptation. God doesn't tempt us, but God may allow us to be tempted in order to strengthen us, even in order to bring glory to God, depending on how we respond to that temptation. So there, there are two errors that we have to be careful about when we, when, we, when we talk about temptation. Two errors we have to avoid. I've already mentioned the first. Temptation never comes from God. We, we can't blame him when we're tempted. But secondly, we need to understand that, that there's no reason to be coward or no reason to be mentally overwhelmed by Satan's power. Satan is only allowed to do what God allows him to do. He doesn't act independently. You're probably familiar with the story of, of Job in the Old Testament and how Satan came and asked God for permission to test Job. God is not going to allow you to be tempted to the point where you're going to fail. He's not out to cause you to fail. He's not out to trip you up. But God may allow Satan to tempt you. 1 Corinthians 1.13 says that, that God limits what Satan can do. We're all tempted but God does not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able. He knows what we're made of. He doesn't allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able, but even with the temptation provides a way of escape. And so please don't get overwhelmed in thinking, wow, Satan just can wail on me all the time, all this temptation. No, while God does not tempt, he will put you through trials and through tests. Some of that may include temptation from Satan, but he cannot do anything that God does not allow. All right, now, as we look here in Matthew 4 at the temptation of Jesus, let's remember that although Jesus was God, always has been God, he's co-equal, co-existent, co-eternal, in, in this case, we know that Jesus was operating not out of his deity, but out of his humanity. Remember that Jesus, when, when he came to earth, that Jesus came in, in, in bodily form. He became a human. Paul in Philippians 2 describes that. He says, even though he was God, he didn't regard that something to be grasped or held onto, but he emptied himself 
and was made in the likeness of a man. Now, why is that important? Because it would be tempting to say, well, yes, Jesus overcame temptation because Jesus was God. Yes, he was God, but in this case, what we're reading here in Matthew, what you read through the Gospels about the life of Jesus was that he was in a human bodily form. He was humanity. He had to deal with the very same things that we deal with. So God, the Spirit, leads him to a place where he's going to be tempted or he's going to be tested right here at the outset of his ministry. Why? First of all, to prove his faithfulness. To prove his faithfulness. Think about the fact that Jesus, in his humanity, there had to be some times he questioned, can I really do this? And we see it at the end of his life in ministry, right? In the garden he's praying, he's, Father, is there any other way? Is there some other way that you can bring about your redemptive plan of saving mankind? But he had the resolve, because he'd been tested, he had the resolve to say, nevertheless, not my will but yours. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 7, in the prophecy about the crucifixion of, of Jesus, it said that he set his face like a flint. As he looked to the cross, he set his face like the flint. He was hard. He was fast. He knew exactly what was going to happen and what he had to do. And even in his humanity, he was able to have the strength and the resolve he needed to carry out God's plan of redemption. Well, what about us? What, what does this temptation of Jesus say to us? Well, first of all, we learn some things uh, about Jesus that help us in our own temptation. The first thing you see in Matthew 4 is that Jesus, in his humanity, was able to overcome temptation. What does that say to us? It says that we, in Christ, also have that same ability. He's operating in his humanity. He's been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. He's hungry. If he was in his deity, he wouldn't have been hungry. If he was in humanity, he's hungry. And that's the point that Satan starts with in trying to trip him up. I'd also point you to verse 11 to emphasize his humanity. In verse 11, it says that after this time of tempting, the angels came and ministered to him. Who are angels? Well, they're lesser beings than Jesus. They're created beings. Why would Jesus, if he was strictly deity, why would Jesus need the ministry of these lesser beings if he was operating out of the strength of his deity? He was operating out of his humanity. And he was weak, and he was tired, and he was hungry, and, and that's why they came and ministered to him. So what we see in the temptation of Jesus was, even in his humanity, he was able to overcome temptation. The second thing I want you to see is that Jesus, because he has been through what we've been through, Hebrews says he was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Because he's been through what we've been through, he's able to sympathize with our weaknesses, he was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. He was subjected to the same weaknesses and the same temptations. Listen, when you're going through a difficult time, whether it's a temptation or a trial or, or something in your life that's unpleasant, when you're going through a difficult time and, and you're praying and you sense the Spirit saying and you sense Jesus saying to you, I know how you feel, don't dismiss that. He knows how you feel. He can sympathize with everything that you and I go through because he lived in a human body and its limitations. The other thing right along with that that you need to see from this temptation is that when Scripture says that Jesus is a merciful and, and faithful high priest, you need to understand that when you come to Jesus with your sins, he is so ready and so willing to forgive your sin. The role of the high priest in, in the Old Testament was when the people came and made sacrifice for their sin, he was a mediator between them and God. Not a perfect mediator because he was a man, but he was the mediator between them and God. So that God would atone for their sin. Jesus in his mercy is able to atone to pay for our sin and also offer us forgiveness. And he, as a merciful and faithful high priest, can give us victory over our sin. Well, look at the temptation. In verses 2 and 3, we're told that Jesus has been fasting. Why was he fasting? Well, that was a very regular, especially in, in the Jewish culture, that was a very regular thing that they did to increase their spiritual sensitivity or increase their spiritual receptivity for the, toward the Lord. It's a good practice today as well. You don't hear much about it. Jesus was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And so what does Satan do? He begins the attack at Jesus' point of physical need. Now, I want you to notice, and you might even want to circle this in your Bible, I want you to notice the very first word Satan utters as he tempts Jesus. This is a major key in, in understanding how we become weak and vulnerable to temptation. First word. You see it? It's a little bitty word. It's just two letters. 
And, but this single monosyllable, this little two-letter word, is a powerhouse in Satan's plan to, to entice us to turn away from a loving father. What's the word? If. If. If you are the Son of God. Now, does Satan know who Jesus is? Absolutely. He knows who he is. That's why he has shown up here to tempt him. He doesn't need proof. He's not saying, if you're the Son of God, prove it to me this way. He's not saying that. He doesn't need proof of who Jesus is. James 2.19, talking to those who claim the name of Christ but don't really believe. If you believe that God is one, if you believe there's one God, great for you. The demons even believe that, and they shudder. Satan knew exactly who Jesus was. So when he says, if you are the son of God, he's not saying, prove to me you're son of God. He's trying to implant a doubt in Jesus' mind that the father really cares about the son. If you're God's son. If you're God's son, why have you been left alone in this deserted, dreary place in this wilderness? If you're God's son, why are you hungry? If you're God's son, how come all this time you've spent fasting to be more sensitive to the Father? How come in all this time he hasn't even met your need for food? If you're God's son, why are you in the condition you're in? And do you see it's the same lie and the same trick that he used in the garden? He tried to cast doubt in, in the minds of Adam and Eve about the goodness of God. Eve, did God say you can't eat from any of the trees in the garden? No, he said, I can't eat from that tree. Well, listen, Eve, here's the deal. God is withholding from you. God doesn't care about you. God doesn't want the best for you. The reason God won't let you eat from that tree is God knows the minute you eat from that tree, you'll be like him. And isn't that what we all want, to be our own God? It's the same trick and the same lie that he used in the garden. And what I want you to hear is this. Satan can easily tempt you to sin and entice you to turn away from God if he can cause you to doubt the goodness of God. If. If you're God's child, if God really is a gracious, loving, caring father, why do you struggle financially? How come you don't have more money? How come you don't have a better job? How come you don't have a nicer house? How come you don't have a, a more dependable car? If you're God's child and if God really cares about you, why do you suffer physically? Why do you have a disability or an impairment or a chronic disease? If you're God's child and if God really cares about you, why do you struggle relationally? Why are you alone? Why are you still single? Why are you divorced? Why are you widowed? Why, why is it you don't even have a single person you can call a, a really close friend and confident? If you're God's child, if God really cares about you, why do you feel so insignificant? Why don't you have a higher place on the food chain, a greater position, more power, a higher status? If, 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 Satan's going to ask you if, and he's going to cast out on the goodness of God, and he's going to make you wonder if you're even a child of God, and if you are a child of God, does God really care? So what does he do? He plants that doubt, and then he encourages us to take matters in our own hands, to meet our own needs, and to do that by whatever means is necessary. Listen, is there anything wrong with Jesus having some bread? No, he's hungry. But what Satan's saying is, if God won't meet your needs, you do it. Jesus, just perform a miracle and, and take care of yourself. You know what you're going to see, and, and you've probably noticed this before, but it, you'll be reminded as we read through the New Testament, and specifically over the next couple of months, the, the Gospels, what you're going to see about the life of Jesus is that he is completely submitted to the Father's will. Jesus himself said, I do what I see the Father doing. He only works miracles. He doesn't perform miracles for himself to satisfy his needs. He doesn't perform miracles so that people will notice him and pay attention to him. He only works miracles at the Father's initiative, and he's not going to take control from the Father's hands. What was Jesus' response? He said, look, we don't live, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. In other words, Satan, listen, my life is not sustained by physical food, but by obeying God and following his purpose and will as it's stated in his word. Simply put, Jesus said, my father is not provided for this need. I'm not going to exercise my will over his. I'll wait for him to supply. I'll wait for him to provide. I'm not going to subvert his will. Here's the thing, if God wills you to live, 
You don't have to have bread. You can live without bread. If it's God's will for you to die, all the bread in the world is not going to keep you alive. Jesus is saying, look, it, it's a spiritual matter, not a physical matter. Our focus is to be on the Word of God. Our needs are met according to His plan and purpose, which is revealed in His Word. And what happens is when we decide we don't like his provision, we decide we're going to take matters in our own hands, and we fail, and we fall to temptation, and we're going to sin, and we're going to follow the plan of Satan. Verse 5 through 8, the second temptation. There, there's the if again, the, the seed of doubt. Hey, Jesus, if you're really God's son, if you're really God, Make him work a miracle for you. Make him do it your way. Now, this is building on that first temptation. Look, God didn't give, if God's not going to give you what you want, force his hand. I mean, you're his child. If you're his child, then, then he has to come through, doesn't he? And, and we're tempted to make God our genie. We go somewhere we know we shouldn't go. We do something that, that we, we know is sin, and then we expect God to, to bail us out. Let me interject here that when a, when a child of God sins and comes to him in confession and true repentance, that child of God is forgiven. God has promised when we bring our sin to him that he forgives us, Isaiah 118, he forgives us and cleanses us from all unrighteousness, Psalm 103, 12, he separates our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. When we come to God in true repentance, we confess and we truly repent, we change our ways, we turn around, God forgives, but that doesn't mean there won't still be some consequences to our sin. That doesn't mean there won't be some circumstances that we have to live with. We say, God, if you really cared for me, you would fix this, or you would do this, or you would give me that. And, and we've got to understand, we can't force God to act or to use his power, especially if it's out of his will. Now, if Jesus had done the swan dive off the pinnacle of the temple, can you imagine, look at how Jesus struggled with people understanding him, with people believing he was the son of God. If he took the swan dive off the, uh, the temple of the pinnacle, and just as the psalmist promised he was held in the hand of God, lest his foot even strike a stone, he would have had instant notoriety. All attention would have been on him. But here's the thing, he wasn't looking for immediate acceptance and, and notoriety. Jesus didn't come to be accepted by the masses. Jesus came to be rejected. And Jesus came to die. Satan's going to tempt you when you're not getting what you want. He's going to tempt you to demand that God prove that he loves you. When God doesn't do what you want and doesn't meet your expectations, he's going to lead you to question God's reliability. And that's what this is. It's a test of God. We're not to test God. We're not to test God. We're tempted to do that when we lack faith. We're not sure that God really is who he claims to be and that he really cares. Finally, in verses 8 through 11, the third temptation, the most brazen offer of all, Jesus said, or Satan says to Jesus, look, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world in return for your worship. Listen, Jesus has already been promised that by the Father. All the glory, all the kingdoms of the world are going to be his after he goes through his death and resurrection. So why is Satan making this offer? Well, he's trying to seduce him to not take the hard road, but the easy road. He's trying to offer him instant power and authority and wealth apart from the way of the cross. What's he doing? He, he's basically saying, look, Jesus, it's just a little compromise. You don't have to go through all that hardship. You don't have to go through all the difficulties you're going to go through and the painful death on the cross. God requires that, but, but why don't you take the easy way? And it's the same way that Satan tempts us. He says, look, look at all the world has to offer. Look at all the success and all the wealth and, and, and health and the good life that could be yours. Look at all the world has to offer. Listen, going God's way is too hard. It demands too much. For goodness sakes, God tells you you have to take up your cross and you have to suffer. So he said, listen, I'm telling you that if you serve me, you can have all the best of the world has to offer. But the question you ought to ask is, how long is that going to last? Satan can give you all those things. 
But if you serve Satan, you can't go his way and God's way. You, you can't do both. And there are a lot of professing Christians who try to serve God and Satan, and, and they think they can kind of ride the fence. I had an old deacon tell me one time, son, you need to be careful about riding the fence. Because the thing about riding the fence is you're either going to fall off or you're going to split your britches. You can't serve two masters. You serve God or you serve Satan. And we would do well to remember when Satan offers us all the pleasures of this life, we do well to think about the payment plan on that. To get all the pleasures and all the things this world has to offer, we serve Satan. And the payment plan very simply is, while you may have all the wealth of this world as long as you live, when you die, you're going to be incredibly destitute, impoverished in the next life of eternal judgment. Whatever joy you might have had in this life is going to vanish at the moment of death. Hebrews 11, in that great hall of faith, Moses is mentioned, and it says about Moses, you remember that Moses was in Pharaoh's household. He had everything that, that he could possibly want and even more, but it says that Moses, rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin, chose to be mistreated with the Israelites. Why? Because he knew the pleasures of sin last only for a season. Satan's going to offer you a lot, but the price is pretty high. Well, let me, let me see, looking at these three temptations of Jesus, let me see if I can bring us to some very clear and succinct application points. And these are great things to write down in that journal space um, in, your, in your booklet. Number one, you have to decide whom you'll believe. Will you believe Satan and the promises of the world, or will you believe God? See, your, your success... And my success in overcoming temptation all boils down to that little two-letter word, if. If God is a gracious and loving Father, if God's plan and purpose is best. I ran across this definition of temptation this week that I think helps really bring clarity that here's temptation is an enticement or an invitation to sin, listen, with the implied promise of a greater good to be derived from following the way of disobedience. The implied promise. You know, Satan is the greatest uh, master at defrauding. The implied promise is a greater good, but he's not going to deliver on it. He can't deliver on it. He can't give you a greater good when your eternity following Satan is an eternity in hell apart from God. So do you believe the way of the world, the way of Satan, or do you believe that God provides the greater good? You have to decide whom you believe. Secondly, you have to consistently focus on the truth. Jesus' answer every time was rooted in Scripture. You can't live by bread alone. You can't test the Lord your God. You can't serve two masters. You have to serve one or you have to serve the other. Where you put your focus determines your direction, determines your outcome. How many of you have ever heard of the moth effect? You ever heard of the moth effect? Most law enforcement guys would know about the moth effect. The moth effect, without going into a lot of detail, and you can, you can Google this and, and look it up. It's not typically called that. It's called target fixation. But the moth effect, just like a moth, if, if you're in a very dark place and you light a flame or, or you uh, put a light bulb out, a moth is drawn to that. It focuses on that and it's drawn to it. The moth effect is that when you're driving down, let's say, the interstate, you're driving down I-30, perhaps at night, because it's more difficult at night, and you see uh, lights, you see flashing lights on the side of the road, on the shoulder, you focus on that so much that before you realize it, you're steering straight in that direction. You've heard stories of people being injured or even killed, law enforcement officers being killed because someone going down the interstate swerved and hit them. That's the moth effect. It's what, what, what they were focused on, and that's what caused them to be drawn that way. What are we focused on? We've got to focus on, on the truth. Psalm 119, how can a young man keep his way pure? By obeying your word, your word I've hid in my heart that I may not sin against God. When temptation comes, we have to have already built the Word of God into our hearts and lives so that that has our focus, so that we're saturating our, our mind and our heart with the Word of God. You have to decide whom you believe. You have to focus on the truth. And then speaking of focus, you have to keep your eyes on Jesus. 
Hebrews 12, as, as we run the race with endurance, what does he say to do? Cast off every sin and everything that entangles us and focus on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Why do we focus on Jesus? Because we look at the temptation he faced in his humanity and recognize he didn't sin. And if he didn't sin and we're in him and, and he died to free us from the power of sin, then we can overcome temptation. It just depends on what we're focused on. When I was in Fort Worth 30 some years ago, I had a, a friend, uh, a guy that I worked with who had a buddy that um, was involved in the business of training guard dogs for protecting property, for protecting people. And, and he was telling Rick the process they went through in training these dogs. And he said, really, the most interesting thing that you would like to see is the final test. He said, after we spent several weeks and sometimes months training these dogs, the final test is we'll take them in a room and we'll put their trainer in front of them and the trainer will give the command to sit and stay. He said, once the command is given, someone comes in from a side door with a steak. Big juicy one, hot off the grill where you, the smell just fills the room. And that platter with the steak, they'll slide directly in front of the dog and see what the dog does. And this trainer told Rick, he said, I can tell in an instant if the dog is going to pass or fail because when that stake comes in and it's slid across the floor right under his nose, if he just for a split second takes a glance, he's done. He's going for it. The dogs that pass the test are the dogs who never take their eye off their master. It doesn't matter what's happening down here. It doesn't matter what they smell. It doesn't matter what they like to do. They never take their eyes off their master. You focus on Jesus. And then finally, along with that, you see temptation as an opportunity to express your love for God. I think about that. You focus your eyes on Jesus. You think about what he's done. And when you consider what Jesus did to love you, you're, you're the object of his love. He wants to be the object of your love. You know that every Temptation that comes your way is an opportunity to tell God how much you love him. You've got to know the truth. It's got to be saturated in your life where the Spirit can use it and speak it to you when you're tempted. You've got to keep your focus on him. If you believe that his ways are better than the world's ways and you keep your focus on him and you train your thoughts and your attention on him, then you have opportunity to say no to temptation and yes to God. Let me point out one final thing here at the end of the chapter. In verse 11, it says that after the temptation, the devil left him and the angels came and ministered to him. Jesus had been in the wilderness. He was tired. He, he was hungry. Again, he was in human form. In his humanity, he had to withstand this barrage of temptation. And so when it was all done, the, the angels, these spiritual beings, came and ministered to him. You know that it says in Hebrews 1.14 that angels are, are um, ministering spirits that are sent to those who have inherited salvation. What does that mean? Angels are there for me and you as well. You know, when we withstand, when we stand up to temptation, when we get through that time, the Spirit of God helps us. The Spirit of God works in us, and I believe, based on Jesus' experience in his human form, that the very angels of God also minister to us and get us through. Listen, we all face temptation, many different kinds, from many different arenas. Jesus, when we say Jesus was tempted in every way as we are, doesn't mean he had every single temptation we've had, but every type of temptation we'll experience, he experienced, and he gained victory over in his humanity, in his humanness, he gained victory. If he did, we can. We just have to be prepared. We have to understand the truths of God's word, and we have to put them to work in our lives, and as we stand for him, he blesses us, we glorify him, we advance the gospel message because we live faithfully for him.